Beste kijker van de Nieuwe Wereld, we gaan iets nieuws doen, themagesprekken. In samenwerking met Pakhuis de Zwijger, de Vrije Universiteit en Moral Markets... gaan we met wereldwijd gerenommeerde economen het hebben over de vraag... hoe ziet de toekomst van het kapitalisme eruit? Deze gesprekken kan je vanaf nu volgen bij de Nieuwe Wereld. Ik wens je veel plezier. Um, Mr. Ruhar, before we start and get into all of this, um, in 2019 you wrote a book called Don't Be Evil. And first off, I'd like to congratulate you because the book is uh, currently being pressed and printed and it will it will appear within the Netherlands within a few weeks. We have the first copy here. So congratulations with the book. And uh, yeah, let's. Uh, I hope that a lot of Dutch people will read it as well. Yeah, it, the it, title is in uh, Dutch. Very Dutch, big tech. It's a very Dutch title indeed. <laughs> I guess that's part of the of the globalized, the globalized world we live in today. But uh, yeah, it has a very <laughs> well, Dutch thank title. Thank you, thank you for having me, and thank you for the compliments about the book. I, I I hope a lot of people read it there too. I think you'll find it interesting. Yeah, 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 sure do. So let's get to it. But let's not give everything away for our Dutch audience, so that they will still have a reason to to buy the book. Um, <laughs> today we are talking about monopolies and new forms of power concentrations, uh, obviously. And there's a lot to discuss here. The internet now is about 30 years old, and in human years, you could say that we could consider that maturely adult. Uh, yet the image you paint in your book is in "Don't Be Evil" is more of an internet which is an adolescent gone astray. <laughs> um, now you give several explanations for that and I'd like to explore all of them, but I hope we can get to it. But the crux of it, if I understand it correctly, is that at some point the internet lost its innocence. And that moment coincides with the rising influence of finance within Silicon Valley, um, so to speak. And what happened there? What happened mm. at the moment and what has been the effect of this collision for the internet as we know it? So big question, um, but let me throw out a few thoughts to begin. Um, the consumer internet, as we know, it really you know, started to take shape in the mid 1990s um, in Silicon Valley. And, <coughs> and that's right about the time that Google was started. And one of the things I did in my book to really understand where we were and where we are today is mm -hmm. to go back to the paper that was done by the founders of Google, Sergey uh, Brin and Larry Page, and to sort of see what were they thinking? What did they think the search engine would be? And it's quite a fascinating paper. Anyone can find it online. One of the most fascinating details, and I, I encourage you to keep reading to the very end, is in the appendix section on page 37, where they talk about what could be the problems of a large scale search engine that was run um, for profit. And what they made clear was that they expected that there could be misuse, disinformation, manipulation mm -hmm. by both private sector and public sector actors if you were using targeted advertising as a, as a way of monetizing uh, a search engine. For those that don't understand what that phrase targeted advertising means, it's what uh, Shoshana Zuboff, a, a Harvard academic, would call surveillance capitalism. It's the mm -hmm. idea that you as a user are being tracked, your movements are being tracked online, and then your behavioral um, uh, voodoo doll, as you might call it, is being sold to the highest bidder, um, to advertisers who can then target you more precisely. So the founders of Google knew at the very beginning that this was uh, rife for manipulation. And that's exactly what we've seen going forward. Unfortunately, um, you know, when companies are born and they're idealistic, um, they, they have venture capitalists and they eventually have to go public and make money. And as I tell in my book, the story of um, Google and its, you know, its early motto, don't be evil, uh, began to be discarded basically right after the IPO. Um, you know, the company decided to go with uh, targeted advertising as a, as a model. It really ramped up that process in the early days after going public. Um, eventually because of the network effects, which allow the biggest platforms to get bigger and bigger and bigger and ring fence data, it was able to essentially uh, eat, eat pretty much all media. Um, basically most of the new, 90% of the new advertising dollars go to either Google or Facebook. Uh, it was able to become the, the purveyor of the world's information or misinformation, as the case may be. Um, and it has grown to a size that is really, even by the standards of past monopoly powers, the 19th century railroad trusts, et cetera, 
is gargantuan. You know, I mean, Google has 92% of the world's search engine action. And one of the things that I'm very interested that I think Europe came to see early and America is now beginning to see is that this isn't really about the price of goods. It's about power. So in, in the past in America, the way in which we have thought about antitrust policy for the last you know, 40 years or so, the idea is, hey, as long as things are getting cheaper, as long as consumers can buy products and services more cheaply, there's no problem. There's no monopoly. But in this new world of surveillance capitalism, you are not paying in dollars. You are paying in data. So, so we all go online. We type in our Google search. We, we think we're getting something for free, but in fact, we're being monitored and we are giving away a lot of value in the form of our data. We don't understand how much that's worth to the company. That is an opaque transaction. That actually goes against the very basic notion of how free markets should work. I mean, Adam Smith, the father of modern capitalism, would have said that you needed three things in order for markets to work properly. You need equal access to information. You need transparency, meaning a shared understanding of what is happening amongst both parties. And you need a shared moral framework. I would argue that none of those things are in effect in the digital world. And so really this is about power. It's not about price, it's about power. Europe understands that America now with the big DOJ uh, antitrust suit against Google, I think it's beginning to understand that. Um, our House um, Judiciary Subcommittee put out a 450 page report looking at how big tech operates. This is a lot about power. It's a lot about cognitive capture. Mm -hmm. It's a lot about um, the way in which uh, the network effects work. So I'll stop right there. But I think basically we are headed into a new world where we're really beginning to see uh, the ramifications of what the transformation ha has been in the last 20 years. Now, at some point in your book, Ms. Fruhar, you mentioned that these firms have kind of convinced us that instead of the usual thinking that monopolies are bad, full stop, they've, they've talked mm. us into convincing us they try to convince us that monopolies aren't necessarily bad as long as they don't, um, well, for example, as long as they don't pose a hazard towards consumers, for example. Right? Yeah. So they've kind of whitewashed the idea of monopolies. How did they do that? And why are we, why is it so nefarious to, to markets? Well, again, this really goes to the idea of um, this not being about consumer price, right? And, and also the power of the network effect. So the truth of the matter is, um, as these platforms get bigger, as they collect more data, they become more powerful, they become more predictive. They do, in some cases, provide better services. I mean, there's no, there's no question about that, but what is the definition of better? We don't really know. We don't understand how much value we're get, giving up to get what is supposedly better. Meanwhile, different actors, smaller companies, European companies, um, competitors from outside the tech space are being cut out of potential competition because they don't have access to this data. They, 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 don't, they, they cannot even get into the ecosystem to start their new plays. Perfect example, I mean, there are a number of search alternatives, <clears throat> excuse me, out there in the universe right now, some of them um, have been started by longtime founders in Silicon Valley that are concerned about surveillance and about privacy and about antitrust. But it's very difficult for them to gain traction in a world in which the largest platforms are, are basically unregulated. So, you know, as Marguerite Vestager in, um, in Brussels has said, this is not about price. This is not even just about consumer welfare. It's about the broader health of an ecosystem. You need to have many, many different companies and even public sector actors being, being able to get access to that information. You need individuals being able to um, uh, recapture some of the wealth, be it in the form of a digital dividend tax, which is something France, California, <laughs> Australia, many other nations have considered. Yeah. Um, power has to be shared. So we've now discussed about Google, but the big tech 
uh, is often mentioned as a group, right? They're a group of, uh, of, of Silicon Valley firms. And one of the things that you mention in the book is that um, they share certain interests with one another. Especially when you, con for example, when we cons uh, consider the patent law reforms, which they advocated under the Obama administration, you mentioned, right? So they wanted these patent law reforms under the guise of that information wants to be free. And I'd like to ask you how successful have they been at the attempt to, to in, within these this patent law reforms? What has yeah. changed in their favor and how does that influence us today? How can we, how can we visualize, for example, the, the monopoly power that you mentioned? Yeah, so it's, it's very interesting. Um, and Jonathan, I'm sure will have things to say about this as well, because the way in which the big tech players manipulated patent law is very similar to the way in which they manipulated copyright law. So the idea is they are, they are trying to monopolize whatever is out there and make it free so that it can be searched and monetized on their platforms. Um, that is harmful to creators, to musicians, to artists who might have copyrights on things, but it's also harmful um, in many cases to inventors who happen to have patents on technologies that they might need. And this really played out, um, this was something that played out in uh, a little over 10 years ago or so in the wake of the Obama administration um, uh, there was a lot of capture actually within the White House by Google. A lot of um, Google employees went to work in the White House. A lot of Silicon Valley employees went to work there. By the way, that's another thing that we do in the U.S. that's kind of unique is there's a tremendous back and forth between the private sector and the public sector. No time limits, lots of vested interests. So um, you had you know, companies, not just Google, but Apple, you know, Intel, others that wanted to incorporate bits and bobs of technology that was patented, well, they want to have to pay as little as possible for those technologies. And so they want to shift the patent system so that it favors their business model, which is essentially about aggregation rather than at this stage, innovation. The innovation tends to happen in much smaller firms, typically before they go public, the aggregation happens later. So the fact that they were able to do this, I think the core point here goes to what I consider to be the biggest problem in America today, which is money politics. You know, mm -hmm. big tech is the largest single lobbying force in Washington right now. Um, there is a tremendous <clears throat> amount of cognitive capture of regulators. There's, there's a lot of sort of expert speak, a lot of blurring uh, and complication of issues that really can be made quite simple. Do we have a regulatory system that serves consumers, citizens, and a broad swath of businesses, or do we not? You know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, sort of hordes of Silicon Valley technocrats that come to Washington and tell us it's all too complicated and really only they can regulate it. This is all part of the problem that we have where um, there has been a, a hijacking of economic and political power and it needs to be curbed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Faruha. Thank you. Looking forward to uh, the next part of the discussion where we will discuss this at length. <laughs> to the second person, international guest, uh, David van Overbeek, is going to interview Jonathan Taplin. The floor is yours, yours, David. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Mr. Taplin, for being here with us tonight. Um, your book, uh, Move Fast and Break Things from 2017, is kind of a reference, I guess, to a slogan or a sort of mentality within Silicon Valley. Could you, before we dive into that book, quickly describe what that um, what its slogan, what the motto, what it amounts to within Silicon Valley? What does it boil down to? Well, it's, it's a kind of rethinking of what we used to call creative destruction. Uh, the notion is that uh, Silicon Valley was the only really unregulated business in America. And so the ability to go and create things without any stopping you was race towards that thing. And then essentially what we've got is a set of systems that only work for the platforms and don't work for all the other parts of society that goes into it. Mm -hmm. I would argue that Facebook and social media in general are a net negative to our society. Uh, essentially, we've just gone through a very harrowing election in which the amount of disinformation, propaganda, and lies that were circulated at 
great volumes on social networks almost created um, an end of our democracy. Now, fortunately, we managed to escape that system, but it seems to me that at, at the core, these companies need to stop having what we call in America safe harbor. And in that sense, I think Europe is really leading. Uh, I've spent some time with Ms. Vestager and I think she has a much better sense of what needs to be done. And, and when I say safe harbor, what, it, what I mean is yeah. that in the United States, if YouTube puts up a piece of music by Bob Dylan on YouTube, there's nothing Bob Dylan can do against YouTube to bring it down. He can file a takedown notice and maybe in a week or so it'll go down, but it can go back up the next day from another user. Because essentially YouTube is saying, we have no responsibility for anything that's on our platform. Now this is a complete lie because as you well know, there's very little outright pornography on Facebook or YouTube. And so they'd spend a lot of money filtering out pornography. They spend a lot of money filtering out total uh, incitement to violence. But they don't spend much money on filtering out just blatant untruths. And so if the same laws that applied to a newspaper or applied to a broadcasting station had applied to Facebook, Google, and YouTube, then I think there would be a lot more responsibility to police their platforms and a great deal less um, of the, the kind of crazy, I, I don't know if you're aware of this theory called QAnon, but it's a group of people in America who now got maybe 50 to 60% of the Republican party believing that America is run by a secret group of pedophiles that uh, drink the blood of children. I mean, it's, it's like insane. So the idea of this, the move fast and break things, it boils down to that these companies, they fail to take the responsibility. They t fail to take in some sense responsibility for the broader context in which they operate, the country which provides them safe harbor, so to speak. And um, of course, there's a lot of talks these days about the detrimental side effects of, of the social media on democracy. You mentioned some of them. I guess most people have seen The Social Dilemma as well, in which this is also part of discussion, the, the, the documentary. Um, what do you think is the most urgent issue within that um, that needs to be addressed right now? Well, you mentioned before, I mean, there are two elements, one of which is at least in the United States, to revoke both the Section 530, uh, 230 Safe Harbor and the Section 512 Safe Harbor around uh, copyright. If those two things were re revoked, then these companies would have the financial incentive to address these things because they could be sued. Uh, and, and that tends to focus the mind. The second thing is to think about the nature of monopoly and whether a company like Google is really a public utility. And now we have privately held public utilities in the United States, um, but they're regulated. And you know, I would cite the example uh, in the 1950s in the United States, we had a monopoly phone company called AT&T. And we forced AT&T in 1956 to make all of the patents that it owned free to any American company or entrepreneur um, without license fee. So in amongst those patents were the semiconductor, the transistor, the laser, the satellite system, the cellular code, so essentially, Silicon Valley was built on these free patents. Without those free patents, there would have been no Intel, there would have been no Texas Instrument, there would have been no Fairchild Semiconductor. None of the major forces like Hewlett Packard that formed the beginning of Silicon Valley could have existed 
without the free patents from AT&T. So Google has a giant patent portfolio from everything from search engine algorithms to car, you know, autonomous car vehicle patents. Mm -hmm. You know, it has a giant patent portfolio. And if Google was made to give all of that for free to any other American company, I think we would see a lot more competition, which is essentially what Lana's book is about. We need competition. Uh, you know, regulation can help, but as she points out, the regulators end up getting captured quite often by the people they're regulating. So we need true competition. If Facebook had to compete with Instagram and WhatsApp on things like privacy, and you know, it might be a much better system. Now, on the other hand, you could say that big tech is sort of recognizing the problems that they are causing, the problems they are facing with respect to society, and they're trying to reach out, begging sometimes almost to help them out, to regulate them. Please help regulate us. Google puts out white papers, for example, asking society to help out with the moral dilemmas that they encounter. Do you think, do you find this plea of them to be honest and convincing? No. It's a PR strategy. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg doesn't really want Facebook to re be regulated. If the safe harbors were revoked, he would spend hundreds of millions of dollars to reverse that. Just like in California, California passed a law that said that employees of firms like Uber and Lyft had to have, you know, pensions and had to have be considered actual employees, not independent contract. Uber, Lyft, and a few other companies spent a hundred million dollars fighting that successfully last Tuesday. Yeah. And now they're once again they're free to completely exploit their employees. Hmm. Now some people say that we should you know, that if we want a solution to this, it has to come from Silicon Valley as well. That we need more technology, so to speak, in order to solve this problem and some of the societal problems that these technologies have caused. Well, if I understand you correctly, it's not just regulation that needs to be enhanced because that is not, that's not enough. Actually, it needs to be more competition. We need to create, for example, our own big tech firms, new big tech firms that can compete with these firms. Um, of course, tonight we're also talking about Europe. And I was wondering what you're thinking about that. As Natasha mentioned, here in Europe, we don't have our big tech giants. But is there an opportunity for Europe there? And should it perhaps create their own an environment in which these uh, big tech giants can foster and can grow? Well, I mean, not to say that the the Chinese are any shining light of, uh, you know, open society, but certainly China has its own champions in every space that it has led. And there's no reason to me that the European Union couldn't have uh, a search engine that was much more attuned to people's privacy than Google is. Uh, and to me, that would be a, a good use of social capital and, and European investment to do that. Um, but also, Europe can play a great role in just leading in the regulation field. Although I'm skeptical about the ability to regulate the United States, I'm not skeptical about the ability, the force that the EU has had in changing conduct. I have to give permission for people, companies to take my information now. Before your GDPR, we never had to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, you are making an effect on the whole world by imposing certain regulations that needless because of the nature of the internet then become worldwide regulations. So should we, for example, also consider to convert the big internet platforms to public utilities? 
that? How should we do that? do that? But I do think you can make them, for instance, pay producers of content a legitimate rate uh, of money uh, in order to do that. You know, I mean, one of the things that concerns me most about what big tech has done is it's created a new class of people which economists are calling the precariat. And that is people who, on one hand, work above the API and tell computers what to do. And below the API are people that computers tell them what to do. That's the kid that drives your Uber or the person that works in the Amazon warehouse. Mm -hmm. Those people have no health care, no unions, no security of any kind, no pensions. And they're essentially forced to be freelancers in a way that giant companies usually had to have some responsibility for their employees. And of course, Uber or Lyft or Amazon has no responsibility for its employees and gives them no benefits whatsoever. So, you know, we are creating this precariat. Put aside the, the horrible effects on the culture that it's had, as I pointed out in my book, you know, it used to be you could make a living selling recordings um, as a musician. You cannot do that anymore. You have to be on the road 200 days a year in order to survive. Thank you, Mr. Zeppelin. Looking forward to the next part of the discussion where we will have a broader discussion with Ms. Faruhar as well. Thank you for now. Yes, Ms. Faruhar. Let me just start this group discussion amongst us um, to give you the a, a, a possibility to respond, of course, uh, uh, to Jonathan Taplin's, Professor Jonathan Taplin's uh, interview. Mm. Because I, well, I saw already y you wanted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was nodding at a few different points, and um, and I have additional thoughts as well. Yeah. Um, I think I think the truth of the matter is. Let me step back. I think we are headed towards a future in which, not just in the digital space, but in many spaces, there is going to be more regional fragmentation. I think that the U.S., Europe, and China you know, have a somewhat different value systems, um, which is only appropriate uh, that, you know, different countries should have different value systems and different forms of governance. And um, my hope personally, now that we've um, elected a normal president, <laughs> is that we're going to see um, some more transatlantic cooperation, that we're gonna see uh, some real discussions about, all right, what are our values around surveillance capitalism? What, what kind of competition law do we think we need to have? I mean, what, what is competition and antitrust really about? Can we say definitively that we have moved beyond um, the, the, the Borkian era of price as a metric into some new era in which power and, and the effects of concentration of power on a broader, broader ecosystem is the standard? I think yes. Uh, I personally think um, that we're going to see this Biden administration in, if not, you know, immediately, very soon after taking office in conversations with Europe about how there can be more broad digital agreement. How can we shape um, the world of intangibles? I mean, right now, um, as Jonathan pointed out, we, we have this system in which as we move and it's been sped up by COVID as we move to all things digital you really get the problems of neoliberalism have been put on steroids. So, you know, the last, the political system of the last 40 years assumed that capital goods and people were equally mobile. And now we can add data into that. Well, capital is quite mobile. Data has been extremely mobile. Physical goods, a little less so, people not at all. And so what happens is you get this divide, this massive divide between the fortunes of companies and in particular, the top, you know, 10 or 20 percent of companies that are basically all about um, capital and data. I'll give you a, a fascinating statistic. Before COVID hit, just a few years ago, McKinsey, uh, the consulting firm, did a, a tally of where corporate value lives. And they found that throughout big companies all over the world, that about 80 percent of corporate value 
was held in just 10% of firms. Mm. And those tended to be the firms that were richest in intellectual property, in personal data, in, you know, in the sort of currency, digital currency of our age. Um, I suspect that that's probably gone to 90, 95% at this point of value being held in those firms. And of course, the big tech platform firms are the largest of them. But in this new world in which China has announced it's going its own way, you know, I mean, as we were electing a new president, the Chinese Communist Party was actually laying down its plans for 2035, which is all about being independent of Western technology, Western supply chains. Europe is saying we want more intra-regional trade. We want a, a tax structure that works for us. We want to have public access to data because that's important in liberal democracies. And so um, the question is, are we going to be in a tripolar world or are we going to potentially be in a bipolar world in which there can be more transatlantic alliances? Um, I'm hopeful at this point that it might be the latter. Um, I'm hopeful about that. And I also think that as we shift, I'll just say one more thing quickly, as we shift from really the consumer internet to the internet of things, you know, all the things that we know about in our, in our phone, all the things that make this so powerful, that's now coming into the industrial space, into the machine space, into the manufacturing space. Europe has world beating firms um, in that area. I mean, the German Mittelstand, um, the Italian export companies, and so many French um, tech innovators, a lot of that is in the business to business space. And so I think if there's a regulatory framework that simply allows competition to happen, I think that Europe can do pretty well in that world. Mm. Interesting. Uh, in this series, which is uh, called the Future of Capitalism, we look for indeed new values, uh, new practices and new institutions. What should we amend uh, in our current economic models or uh, uh, economy uh, that that that, well, um, helps us deal with societal challenges and also the problems it creates themselves, right? Like, for instance, the creation of a, 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 a proletariat, a new proletariat, or as you called, precariat, as you called it, uh, Professor Taplin. Um, so if, if I would ask you, what kind of new institutions should we envision? What would well, be your answer? My, my problem is that I always have believed that culture precedes politics. Yes. I'm the oldest person in this gathering. <laughs> I was lucky enough to be involved in the civil rights movement in the United States in 1963 and 1964. And by a lot of ways, it was led by cultural figures. And what's the problem for me today is that the culture of the United States, at least, is a very nihilistic culture. Mm. If you look at all, what is the popular television shows, whether it's Succession or Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones or strange mm. things, it, it's all dark. The world is coming to an end, dystopian kind of sense. And the heroes are all the worst kind of people you can possibly imagine. Now, some people say, well, that's just an e effect of the Donald Trump worldview, you know, that a reality TV star can become president. And so everything is just about what you can make. But I, I also see that in the music business. I mean, I grew up in a time when, you know, there were inspirational anthems like Times They Are Changing or We Shall Overcome. But if you listen to the hip hop and rap music of today, it is very dark, dystopian, and angry. And so I think that a culture needs some kind of aspirational culture. Now, all of this is reflected, of course, in the fact that particularly in the United States, what Angus Deaton calls deaths of despair are going through the roof. That is mm -hmm. people who are killing themselves yes. through al alcohol, drugs, yeah. suicide. And so needless to say, the politics of the moment play off of all of that, right? I mean, you have a candidate who, whose whole thing was American carnage. The society is going down the tubes. You know, this is all horrible. And all this 
change is bad for us. If we somehow can get out of that mindset, then I think there's a great possibilities for positive change. But right now we're in a d- very dark place. Mm. And, you know, I was struck by the fact that the only hope in the pre-election time coming out of the culture was coming from the NBA the athletes, the basketball players. You know, LeBron James with his shirt saying vote that you saw every day. And the fact that he forced the NBA to put on a one minute commercial for voting every 30 minutes of the whole NBA finals was an act of power that used to come from the musicians is now coming from the African-American, you know, sports stars. And so maybe that's a possibility of hope as well, you know, but quite frankly, I have been saying for a long time that we're stuck in an interregnum. And the Italian philosopher said, Gramsci said, the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, many morbid symptoms appear. And we are caught in this place where the old systems are clearly going out the roof, but this new system, whether it's social networks or autonomous cars or autonomous airplanes, like the Boeing 737 MAX, they're not working right yet. And so we're caught. We're in a bad place. All right. Well, Ms. Furuhar, what do you think of this, well, I can almost say cultural analysis of nihilism within American or European culture? And what is the relation to your, in your mind with, uh, with the digital world that we've created? It's, it's a fascinating question. I, I love, I don't in, agree entirely with, with Jonathan's dark view, but it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating point. And um, I do think that artists, creators are sort of canaries in the coal mine here um, of, of what, what is happening. I completely agree with that. Um, I will say, it's funny, I, I live in Brooklyn, New York, which is a very, very blue borough, um, very blue part of a blue city in a blue state. And I was struck because I heard um, uh, Sam Cooke's version of um, a change is going to come blasting from one of the windows when Biden was elected. So you would have been happy about that, Jonathan, I think. I I know we're ISIL. In the 1950s. <laughs> well, it's true. And, you know, it's reminding me, I mean, just to stay on culture for a minute, it's reminding me of a conversation I'm sure you'll remember when Neil Young was um, – was uh, he, he put out a, an album, I forget when, but um, Keep on Rockin' and the Free Ro- World was on it. Um, and right. I remember him being asked about that. And he's like, well, you know, I looked around and nobody was, none of the younger people were, you know, was putting out this music. And so I thought I got to keep doing some protest here. Right. And, right. Uh, and that is fascinating. I think that part of that, uh, you would know better about the the creators, but I think that part of it comes from the fragmentation that is part and parcel of the new technology. I mean, you know, Neil Ferguson, a a historian, wrote a wonderful book called The Tower and the Square, and he likened the change that we're going through now to the advent of the printing press, where, you know, suddenly you could read the Bible in your own language, and there was all this sort of Um, a fragmentation and individualism and chaos, and eventually you come out in a better place, but first you have 150 years of religious wars. And so it does feel a bit like we are all, I mean, we see it in our own households. We're all in our little silos and the high speed nature of it. I mean, just the, the kind of attention span issues that come with this technology are, I'm going to date myself. I'm, I'm 50 years old, but It's stunning to me, you know, that my son, but I'll just give one stat. My son, who is a, you know, just turned 14, um, briefly became a TikTok star, literally coming up with some 15 second video of himself doing pull-ups with aspirational music. And suddenly he's got 5 million hits. I don't think I've ever had 50,000 hits for something in my life. I mean, this is, and I'm like, I'm a professional. This is what we're dealing with. But Jonathan, what were you going to say? Well, I'm just worried that we're, we're in this kind of strange world in which 
there's this it's very hard to be kind of optimistic mm. and the default position is nihilistic mm. um, you know there was a okay. wonderful book about a movie called Chinatown um, <laughs> and, and Sam Watson wrote and, and he said look if you think about the great books of America you know the great Gatsby or uh, Moby Dick, the symbol of the green light or the symbol of the whale were all kind of aspirational symbols in some sense. But if you think about Chinatown, it's Chinatown, Jake. The fix is in. There's no, Escape. nobody is going to win here at all. Yeah. And that well, sense is what leads to people, for instance, say, why should I bother to vote? Yeah. Nothing's going to happen. And, you know, I mean, as much as the vote went up quite a bit this last Tuesday, it it's still 79 million people didn't bother to vote who could Indeed. have voted. In, indeed, but but I also saw a lot of hope speeches and internet tweets on the fact that Kamala Harris now is the the, the vice president elect. And and let me let me let me go on the Gramsci quote from you: "If the new times haven't been born yet, Professor Taplin, what do we need to envision, organize, debate about? Um, um, how can we stop this nihilistic default?" Um, in, to, to imagine or envision a, a, a society and an eco economic uh, system that functions, uh, that is just, that doesn't create a precariat, but right. uh, that produces fair results for everybody. Well, I mean, one of the thoughts I've had for a long time is that the digital economy lends itself to a kind of new cooperative ventures. In other words, if a group of musicians in the Netherlands decided to form a music distribution co-op, yes, they could use all of the tools that are out there. And even if they rented some space from Amazon Web Services to run their system, they could end up taking the majority of the economics out of the system, as opposed to letting YouTube take the majority of the economics out of every music video that gets posted on YouTube. In other words, you, the cooperative ventures could change the nature of the way this society works. And besides, the very fact that the distribution costs of moving a piece of music across the internet are almost zero makes it kind of an attractive way to do things. Yes. And, the, and the, so the, could I, yeah, of course. Could I, yeah, can I jump in and just give an example too in the in the democracy space? Taiwan is a is a terrific example of how decentralized technologies can be used to enhance participatory democracy. They have a terrific digital minister Audrey Tang who um, has made a big push to give everybody um, using blockchain technologies, uh, digital IDs, you can do voting online, you know, there's every little decision you can weigh in on. And so trust in the technology allows for trust in government, trust in government allows for better government, which creates more trust. So it becomes a virtuous circle. Yes. Yeah, that is that is very interesting because in our series, this is the eighth edition and the commoning of the economy um, uh, creating these, these co-ops is mentioned a lot from different uh, uh, theoretical backgrounds. Also, if you look about the future of the corporation, for instance. Um, we yeah. have a question from the audience for you, uh, uh, Ms. Veruha, and that is from Connie. And I always like to, to, to name the name, but do you see an escape in unbundling the private and the public sector, like creating, for instance, with public money, a public good or public internet? That is, and, and we always say here in the house, we talk a lot about commons. The commons is not private, not public, but something in between. But this question yeah. is about the public side of the debate. I, I absolutely think that that's going to happen. I mean, a couple of couple of points. Um, Google has a, a an arm called Sidewalk, which creates smart cities all over the world. And there was a big and interesting example in Toronto recently. Over the last couple of years, they developed essentially took over um, a large swath of the Toronto. Um, waterfront and put sensors everywhere. And there's a lot of good reasons for this. You know, you can get 
um, a lot of energy efficiency, better traffic patterns, et cetera, et cetera. But what was fascinating is that Google was going to own all this data. The city of Toronto was not going to own the data. And suddenly when activists began to expose this, there was this, oh, wait a minute. We know what if, A, what if the public, i.e. taxpayers and voters and citizens want to keep some of the value of that data? What if some small Canadian companies want to have access to it for innovation purposes? So um, that was that was changed. The, the rules of the game were changed. And in fact, it was agreed that um, the data would go into a kind of a public data bank that would be governed and, and companies would get equal access. Now, interestingly, in the wake of COVID, uh, Google shut down that project. They said that it was no longer viable. They wouldn't say why. Um, but I suspect that we're going to see more situations like that. I do think, though, that the, the pandemic has really, um, just as it has been kind of a scrim that has been pulled up on so many existing problems that are there, it has brought forward this notion of public investment for public goods. I mean, the truth of the matter is that there are some things that the private sector either doesn't want to invest in because the margins aren't high enough or they find too risky. Mm. Um, and so, you know, things like laying down broadband cable or, you know, to go back in the past, seeding the railroad businesses, the internet itself came out of the military, came out of DARPA, you know? And so I think that you're now going to see um, not just in the US, but also in Europe and certainly in China, the sense of the public sector needs to come in first and say, here's an area we care about. We feel this, this thing is a public good. We need investment. We need a national strategy for how to get that. And then you will see the private sector, um, probably because they have more safety um, and certainty coming in and helping to commercialize. Mm. So... Uh, Prof Professor Teplin, just to ask you the question as well, what do you think of the comments uh, Ms. Of, of, of what Ms. Faruhar has said? And perhaps you want to tie that into your story of um, this nihilism, this kind of stalemate that we are in as well, because this, this sounds quite hopeful, what we need to do, what needs to be done and what can be envisioned just over the horizon. But if I understand you correctly, it also takes some form of, to put it in my own terms, kind of cultural momentum to get us there. Who is going to take the charge in that? Well, I think this is a bottom-up issue, you know, yeah. quite honestly. I, I, I'm, I've been talking about what in the U.S. maybe we could call new federalism, the idea that innovation in society has to come from the edge. Uh, it, it never, you know, I, I, one of the first sponsors of the Innovation Lab was IBM. And uh, Sam Palmazano, who was the president of IBM at the time, said to me in a meeting, we need to lower the center of gravity of IBM, yeah. which meant that we had to get decision making outside of the central Armonk headquarters mm -hmm. to let people in India make the decision for what IBM should be doing in India and let people in Japan make decisions for IBM. And, and that is true in governance as well. So we were lucky enough to work with the, the city of uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, in which the local utility, which was publicly owned, uh, in other words, owned by the people, uh, called EPB, built a broadband network, fiber to every single home, in Chattanooga. And, you know, they went up against Comcast, which was the big, uh, you know, centralized player. And they underpriced them. They gave people, you know, 200 megabits per second at $28 a month for internet. Yeah. And now they have about 65% market share. Yeah. And, and it's not that they're pricing it so low as a charity, they're actually making money off of that. So, I mean, the point is that, you know, innovation can happen in all sorts of ways. And of course, what that did was bring all sorts of things like video game companies to Chattanooga because it was such screamingly fast internet, uh, you know, and, and now, you know, they're giving people a gigabit per second and it's yeah, very and that, Interesting because that, that sounds also as a, 
organized like a common right. Uh, yes. um, and of course, uh, 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 Ms. Faruha, you already said that innovation tends to come from a company who has not yet had his IPO um, yeah. or will never have uh, uh, their IPO, right? Um, so, so there is some hope because other uh, economists as well mentioned the bottom of movement. For instance, the youth climate movement who has really gone to the streets to demand better policies uh, to fight climate change. Um, Indeed. Yeah. And I, you know, I would also encourage, there's a wonderful book by a friend of mine, Glenn Weil, called uh, Radical Markets, um, that talks about all the ways in which decentralized technologies exactly. are now going to make possible um, more democratic participation in ways that, that they couldn't before. Things like quadratic voting. Um, you know, there's, there's, we're at a really interesting moment. And it, the outcomes, even though they could be scary, we could see more monopoly power. You know, you could see a kind of world in which we've got the Washington consensus, the Be Beijing consensus, and the Facebook consensus. Or you could imagine a world in which um, these decentralized technologies allow individuals really to have much more of a voice. Yeah. And I, I, I'm hopeful about the latter. Yeah, and then the question, of course, is if that it has a potential, what should we, how can, can societies pave the way for these examples to be successful and be a true alternative, right? And then yeah. you, of course, come to the question of institutions uh, 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 and and. And, is, and we talked a little bit about antitrust law and, and, and your, your, your ideas about that. That is, of yeah. course, a clear suggestion for institutional change. Do you have any other suggestions which we should um, consider for this? Yeah. Well, let me just, um, I'll, I'll have one final thought and then I'll sadly have to come off of the call. But, um, and not to plug my third book, but I'm actually getting ready to auction my third book, which is about this very topic. Um, I think we are headed towards a post-neoliberal world. And by neoliberalism, I mean the sort of Anglo-American laissez-faire, let capital goods people go wherever they want with, without understanding that that is going to privilege the, the wealthiest and the most mobile relative to everybody else. And so I think, and that, that, that theory, by the way, I mean, it came from the 1930s, Mont Pelerin Society, but it was really sort of um, institutionalized in the U.S. Um, by Milton Friedman and the University of Chicago. So that's that's been something that has been institutionally um, dominant really now for half a century. Pendulum swings in the political economy tend to happen about every 50 to 70 years, and we're due for one. And so I think that what you're going to see is across a wide swath of society and a wide swath of sort of academic thinking, not just law with antitrust policy, but also economics with what does the, the post Milton Friedman world look like? Um, you're gonna see conversations between economists and biologists because frankly, economists have been living in an ivory tower thinking that they were, you know, could just do mathematical models and they were much more like physicists. Guess what? No, the world is messy. People aren't rational. You know, everybody except for economists has sort of known that intuitively for a while. Now they're getting on the bandwagon. Um, so you're going to see a really interesting and rich conversation going on. I mean, I'm already part of some of these um, at the OECD's New Economic uh, Initiatives yes. group. I'm, I'm, I'm taking part in some of those at open markets in the U.S. We're having them in many, many places. It's exciting, you know? I mean, Jonathan's right. The new, the new new thing has yet to be born, but the conversation about it has started and it's a really, it's a really cool one. Yeah, actually, this, of course, this series is also in the eye of that storm, right? Uh, it, trying, to, uh, trying to talk to people to envision what's, what's, off, what's, what's going to be next after neoliberalism. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, congratulations with your Dutch translation. Uh, let me repeat it in Dutch, but you can buy... Uh, uh, the book of Rana Ferruar um, in Dutch. It's called Big Tech. And now we're going to say something in Dutch. Hoe we onze privacy, vrije markt en democratie in de uitverkoop doen. That's the Dutch undertitle, subtitle. Um, uh, I, I, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, take care there. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, because uh, for, for, for a few moments now, I want to go back to Professor Tavlin, because you started with quite a groomy uh, 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 analysis, right? You said 
culture should pre uh, uh, should come before politics. And our culture, if you looked at the music and the series which are popular, tend to be nihilist. And you said we need to change that, uh, otherwise we won't change politics, and then we won't change our economic models. Um, but uh, but of course, uh, uh, Rana has tried to persuade you in to to opening up to a possibility of the alternative. Well, I, I think the two go together. Obviously, if if you had a better economic model uh, in terms of how culture makers could produce their content, yes, then the the nature of the content might be different. In other words, there's an interaction. The between Marvel, them. the Marvel TV movies yeah. or films that dominate the you know film business when it when there was a film business uh, are of necessity dystopian right i mean it, it assumes that there's some superhero going to come down and save the universe from horrible bad forces you know and you know perhaps that was you know donald trump's pitch in 2016 you know but those are always lies. Those are not true. Those are fantasies. And as long as the culture lives in this fantasy universe, we're not going to really deal with the reality. So if the culture had ways that people could make things that weren't necessarily going to cost $100 million to make a movie and stuff like that, you know, maybe a different kind of more optimistic culture might exist. I mean, certainly that was my experience in the 60s. Mm. When Bob Dylan made a record, it cost like $10,000 to make, you know? And, and so he could, he could say whatever he wanted to say. Nobody was gonna to object to what, what his songs were or tell him, oh, that doesn't fit the algorithm of what Spotify wants to hear right now, you know? I mean, it wasn't that. But quite honestly, the big tech guys are going the exact opposite direction. I was at a conference at Google last year when they, they were suggesting that artificial intelligence could write the screenplays, that artificial intelligence could edit the movies. And I said, well, why do you want to do that? You're just going to get what you already had. I mean, that. But so you feed 10,000 screenplays into an AI thing, and what is it going to spit out? <laughs> you know? So, I mean... Uh, it's I'm, actually a really hopeful message because you're saying, be a maker, produce your own culture, uh, exactly. start, start, being, start, start being an artist and start making stuff and, 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 and try to find your connection to audiences uh, without using these big platforms. And by the way, the tools are all there. Yeah. Well, so make your own album in your basement with your Mac and I, you know, Pro Tools or the yeah. tools cut a movie that you made with your iPhone are all there. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, that's, that's actually really, I mean, being part of the revolution, if you want to be part of the revolution, become an artist and start making stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Beautiful. Exactly. That, that, that is actually a very nice th thought. Um, um, we're going to go to the last part of this uh, talk. And I, I'm, I'm going to invite Sam de Munk uh, to join us uh, at this table, the, the young economist who was opening uh, this session with his uh, text and column. And my, my, my question, of course, to you is, uh, you listened to this conversation. It was an open, explorative conversation, actually. And we got all these notions from uh, uh, Ms. Ryan Anna Ferruar and, and Professor Johnson Taplin, what you 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 post some questions, right? Um, how can we solve some of the issues you're dealing with, or you you mentioned? What did you think about the what did, what were the, your thoughts during the conversation? Yeah, um, I've I've many points, and just to tie in a bit to the the last point, I I completely agree that uh, you can make make stuff and music. I'm myself also uh, one of the guys with cheap, um, yeah cheap material, uh, mics, recording an album. Uh, so so I, I very, very much agree with that. Um, but of course, yeah, getting out and reaching an audience there, the whole business uh, becomes an issue. Um, 
But uh, coming back a bit to your question about the solutions for today, I think uh, one of the main things that is raised is sort of the political will to actually go through with these actions. That seemed to me to be the key issue. It's not that it's too complicated and we don't know what the solution is sort of, but it's just more do we have the people in power who are actually going through with this? Uh, and for me, um, I've been for the last year also for my master thesis looking into research on uh, political power. And for me, that was quite shocking uh, to read that not only in the US you might expect with all the money involved in politics that indeed big business, rich people have disproportionate influence on what comes out. But even in a country like, like the Netherlands where money plays almost no role in politics, virtually the same outcomes can be observed in research. And for me, this is really concerning. So what can we do that taking out the money to money of politics doesn't seem to solve the problem. Because the, the influence of big tech, for instance, on uh, lobbying, on the political process, is still, a powerful, is still a powerful process. That is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, and I think there might be a difference in Europe since it's not our big tech, that in that way, maybe here their influence is a bit less, but mm. our local or our national companies maybe have yeah. similar impact. So if, yeah. I'm also thinking if we want to have our own big tech firms, how can we sort of ensure that they won't become just as influential as these big tech firms are in the US right now? Yeah, yeah good That's question. Very interesting thought. And I think also what um, thinking about what Professor Taplin has said during the discussion about th this notion of nihilism um, is that um, there's something that goes beyond just the power or the money question here, I think. So it's also about kind of a worldview or kind of a way that we tend to think about technology or the role that it plays within society and we're kind of, on the one hand, comforted by these technologies, but on the, on the same side, you can say that they are creating all these new precarious elements within society, but we don't care enough actually to do something about it because we're also very comfortable in our own little bubble. And watching Game of Thrones. And watching Game of Thrones, yeah. yeah. So there is, there is uh, which I find very interesting, something deeper going on there. Yeah. Something which is, it kind of transcends just purely the, 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 the idea of money or influence of yeah. power over this. It's, it's really maybe a cultural issue as well. Yeah, that, that is of course the, an important takeaway of, 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 of tonight, right? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure whether it's completely separate from the power question though, because no. I think no. the things you mentioned that, for example, increasing like what was also mentioned earlier, a pre, the precariat, I think creating that sort of new social class, that's also a power question. So I yes. think the power involved in running these, these kind of companies, these platforms, making sure that artists don't earn money anymore. I think these, these things are more of power and I think these, these could be embedded in yeah. corporate governance. So your question actually is, but we, do, we only have one minute <laughs> left for this evening is, is there a political will to actually deal with these issues on the level where it, which should be dealt with? And of course, uh, that is an open question, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm looking yeah. at, uh, as Mr., at Professor Tavlin. Uh, do you think there is a political will? A very short answer. We, we only have time for a very short answer for that. Well, I think the whole notion for me that just because you have money taken out of politics doesn't really change the game is kind of frightening. Yeah. You know, our Sorry. assumption has been <laughs> that all we had to do was get the money out of politics yeah. and and everything would be fine, but maybe that's not true. <laughs> we'll send you uh, his, his master thesis so you can study uh, it. I, uh, I want to read it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to leave anyway. it at that. But thank you yeah. so much, uh, uh, Professor Tavlin. My pleasure. Um, uh, and um, thank you, all the viewers, for watching and asking all these questions. Um, next week, we'll be back with the ninth edition of the series with uh, Luigi Zingales and Christian Felber on the viability of a new model market system. Um, if you want more uh, information of the coming editions, you can go to the Swijger.nl and for more information on the future market consultations, you can go to moralmarkets.org slash future market uh, consultation. Uh, we're very proud uh, uh, that we had you here. Thank you so much also to you, Sam, uh, for your um, contribution today. And uh, um, that that, that then the only thing which is left is to say thank you and have a great evening. Thank you so much.